I run and own a multi-million dollar group of companies. I'm all calling. I love working. Your objectives in life needs to be in line with the effort you're willing to put in. You never see someone successful in business but broke. Gladiators, welcome back. Today I've got a special gladiator for you. He's actually not a gladiator, he's a Praetorian. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce to you Firaz Al Masadi. Did I pronounce it? Yeah. You're perfect. But you know, when you looked at me, I thought yeah, maybe yeah, I got no, it wrong. Perfect. Sounds good. Absolutely welcome to our office today. Thank you very we much. We call our me. office called the arena because in the arena 2,000 years ago, people used to go in and if they didn't practice their moves, their strategy, what would happen to them? They'll die. So we call this arena called life. Okay. So welcome to this arena. Thank you very Tell much. Tell us a little bit about you, if you don't mind, where you are right now. I know you own a very successful real estate company. Uh, yeah. And there's probably more to it than I just explained, right? So, yeah. um, so currently I'm, uh, well, I'm 38 years old. I've been in Dubai for the last 15 years, married for the last 14 years, four kids. And uh, I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm into different businesses, but my core is real estate. I run and own a multi-million dollar group of companies. Um, so fan properties basically is was the seed for all the, the other companies that I started. Um, back in March 2009, fast forward today, fan properties is the largest real estate company I would say ever created in Dubai with uh, 22 branches across the city, 850 employees. And we're also the most technologically advanced real estate company in Dubai to the extent that we're the only company that was mandated by the Land Department to create DXP Interact, which is an interactive platform that took the transparency of the way real estate market really to the next level. Uh, and that was launched last year. So what was the pain that you saw that your, your interactive solutions fixed? Um, I think as a company, we speak, we speak both languages, the real estate street language, as well as the institutional language. And they're two different, but they complement each other. Um, so obviously the institutional language is more into data and uh, statistics and facts. The street language is more on the emotional side of sales and brochures and what so have you. And in my humble experience, I feel that both should be based on facts and both should be based on so data you kind of building trust, right? Yeah. With the consumer. I just felt that there's a need for us to give access to Real uh, also clients and uh, individuals to the same data that an institutional investor depends on to make their investment decision. Mm -hmm. And we've done it in a way that is very friendly and easy to understand. I'm sure it was a huge investment from your part, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Long term investment. I mean, I always believe that if you want to buy something, I mean, OK, if I tell you that the market, the overall market's up or down by 10 percent, sounds good. It's good to know. But at the end of the day, you're not buying or selling the entire market, right? You're buying in a particular project and a particular uh, type of property, whether it's commercial, residential, a one bedroom or three bed. And that's why we call it the XP Interact because it's interactive and it enables you to really narrow down your search to the to the exact, precise kind of or type of property that. So you got data for. going through this system all the time. Yeah, and yeah. fixing incredible. Yeah. So it's not all based on opinions of the salesperson who's going to tell you anything. No. It's all factual based, so you're making yeah. calculated decisions, yeah. real decisions. Yeah. Wow, amazing. So this, we we salespeople. Yeah. Uh, when you, you arrived here, March two thousand and nine. Yeah. Uh, I started my company in March 2005. Okay. And you, I have December 2005. And then from there... December 2005. So what were you doing from 2005 to 2009? Uh, well, I started as... Well, I arrived in 2005. So Where from? Pretty much Syria. Okay, amazing. Yeah, so 2006 till end, towards end 2007, I was selling clothes in a fashion shop called... Well, it's Armani uh, Clothing in Deir City Center and Emirates Towers. And then uh, I took my vacation. I did 22 days in real estate instead of traveling. I liked it. I felt it's for me. I went back, I resigned, and then I started my real estate journey. Uh, one year later, one year and a half later, I decided to start my own. That when was the were... peak of the global real estate crisis. Yeah, I came here September 2009, which was the worst time, right after yeah. Ramadan. Well, yeah, the market, yeah. which is good for me yeah. because when people have headaches, they're looking at people to fix it, yeah, right? Yeah. So 
just going back to the uh, the clothing retail, were you the best salesperson in Armani? Yeah, yeah. My first year, I was number one, uh, UAE. So what makes you number one all the time? What do you think is that little nugget that you can share with us that makes somebody successful? Uh, I think I'm self-motivated and I learned to, to separate my mindset from my mechanics. So I always, obviously, we try to push ourselves and maintain very positive mindset. But whether I'm in the mood or not, I'm in a good mindset or not, I, I keep moving, I keep my mechanics moving. And I believe that when you move, you progress, and when you progress, you grow. your mindset will follow. Yeah. And also, I guess you're good with people. Yeah, I mean, you have to. You have to For be people good. to do business with you, they need to like you too. Amazing. And then when you went from clothing to real estate, you didn't think, oh, I don't know this market, nobody trained me, did it? You just got stuck in. Yeah. yeah. Would you say, and also it was recession time, so how did that go? How did that uh, progress happen? From you being one-man band, did you have a team of people who came no, with you? It was literally just me. I had the receptionist, and then slowly, slowly I've grown the team. Then my brother, who is a tech guru, joined me two years later. And uh, yeah, and together we, you know, we made it, we made it happen with the amazing team that we built. Amazing. And you said you had 20 odd branches. Yeah. These are physical branches. Yeah, these are now, 22. Now, do you think that's branches. necessary with the way, you know, the, the, the COVID came and people were talking about not having offices? Do you think using technology, you need so many because, or you feel physically you have to be there in the neighborhoods? We're a very client-centric organization mm -hmm. with a long-term view. Uh, in business and I think it's important for the agents I think the market is maturing and part of this maturity is specialization mm -hmm. so and to be a client centric the first thing you need to know is your product the products that you're selling so you can provide the right advice so we felt it's important to have agents right there in their location because they will understand the community more they'll build long-term relationships with their clients and it's all about I mean we're all in a we're all competing for who adds the most value to clients. Yes, yes. So, and you feel that being that kind of geography really, really does help. Although it means a higher cost to you. It yeah, means a higher yeah, investment yeah, from yeah. you, right? Much, it's a big much risk. higher cost. Exactly. Uh, yeah, but I think it's, it's a very well calculated move because everything, I mean, it's, it's not costly when you compare it to the value, the value you're adding exactly. to your clients. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah. And uh, what are your current challenges at the moment? I know the challenges change, right? Yeah. yeah. What are your biggest challenges right now? Because you're, you've got momentum, right? You're a juggernaut in the, in the uh, industry. I think the, I mean, the global economy is one, of, one thing that, you know, you go to YouTube, you just see all these videos about the recession, you come back to the, to, to the streets in Dubai and you feel all the, the fundamentals are great and things are happening. So trying to balance. I mean, I'm very risk averse. I don't like to take chances on people uh, just to get people to follow my dream. I wouldn't hire like a bunch of people because I think I can make something happen. And in the back of my head, if it doesn't work, I just let them go. Mm -hmm. So I think taking these well cal calculated risks uh, and always factoring the worst, mm -hmm. you know, and seeing how do you become how, prepared? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. When would you say do at the moment I hear different things, right? People are saying recession, but it seems that like the whole world's coming to Dubai right now. Is that yeah. how you feel? Yeah. Which markets are doing well from your experience? Which one aren't doing well? I hear the high end luxury markets doing really well. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, for sure. Um I think of course Dubai had a very still has a very high level of agility, so they moved much faster during COVID. Uh and then they moved ahead with the expo. So the city was very well prepared, like they say. You know, luck is when, when preparation meets with uh, opportunity, right? So Dubai has been preparing for this for so long. And then at some point in time, if it wasn't COVID, it would be something else. That, that trigger would happen and people would come and they would see what Dubai has built. And I've spoken to many ultra high net worth individuals who've invested heavily in Dubai in the past few years. And they all said that they couldn't believe when they looked at the infrastructure and at the value of properties, they couldn't believe. They, they felt it's the most undervalued market they've ever seen in, in the world and that's why smart investors have really jumped in heavily towards end of COVID knowing that the more people they get 
exposed to the city, the more people are going to come back to, to, to Dubai. And of course, during COVID or towards the end of COVID, only the rich could fly. Yes. So Dubai was really the best hot destination yes. for, yeah. The super wealthy. Yeah. And um, I noticed that you front the, uh, your brand a lot because I've been following you yeah. personally. Do you feel that helps your brand? Because you're still out there visiting these properties, you're giving advice online. How's that affected you, um, your brand? I've never had social media in my entire life, even during my, when I was a teenager. Uh, but I, I mean, obviously the world has evolved a lot and I felt it's very important for me to stand up for my brand, for my people. And uh, yeah, and I felt that was a duty for me. You know, when I speak to my wife or to my brother, I say, this is a sacrifice I did because it's not an easy job, you know? Uh, yes. And it's just one extra. So it doesn't come naturally to you being on, in front of the camera because it looks natural. It was, no, it was very difficult at the start, uh, but I don't prepare scripts or, you know, it's, it has to be very spontaneous. And that's the time you get the right ROI for it. Mm -hmm. Like I tell people, my, despite what you're selling, what you need to expose on your social media is what do you want to be known for? Yes. And what information you already have you just go and spontaneously put it on social media. Share. And those who, those who are looking for this kind of knowledge and value, that will gravitate and they will... So, yeah. So, we're not, so I'm not a social media influencer. Sure. Right? It doesn't come easy yeah. to you. It's a business yeah. and you do it naturally. As, yeah. yeah. Because you're passionate about the industry yeah. still, right? Yeah. You're yeah. still passionate it's, about... It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Not clothes yeah. anymore. No, no. <laughs> yeah, you just like buying them. Yeah, 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 cool. Yeah. So along the way, you actually somewhere along the way, you found time to get married. Yeah. And go to the gym. I noticed. Oh, Fourteen I, years. I, I, I hate you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> God, he goes Gosh. to the gym. He's got a business. Oh my God, I'm jealous. So, um, where did you get the time? Time for I think family. We all have twenty four hours, but we need to, like I said, we, like everyone says, actually prioritize. And I think priorities change with with time so my priorities 10 years ago are different from my priorities today but i think gym and fitness is so important it's not a pro it's not a priority it's a, it's actually Part it's of like life. oxygen mm -hmm. you know and i think if you want to enjoy everything else in your life the first thing you need to make sure that you're doing is you're healthy or you're doing right. what it takes to, to be healthy is your wife healthy does she exercise uh yeah yeah, yeah. wow yeah. and then your children how old are they boys girls I have two boys, two girls. So Muhammad is 10, Faris is 7, and then Ali and Sarah are 4. So they're babies, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. So they demand a lot of time from you, or you you kind of, again, disciplined to find time. Do you pick him up from yeah. school? Do you have time to do all that? I, do you spend well, time doing that? With my first work? two, I used to literally take them to school every single day. Wow. Uh, but then when we have four, it becomes more and more challenging. Uh, but yeah, I do spend quality time with my family. I, you know, I mean, weekends are holy for me with right. my family. Uh, I try to put them to sleep a few days a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the summer holiday. So I go for a full month. Good. It's uh, important. I, I have a 29-year-old and a 28-year-old. Wow. And I've got, for my second marriage, I've got a 15 and 8. Wow. My biggest regret is that I was building businesses when I had my first two, and I missed out on it because I was always yeah. working. And I didn't set uh, boundaries to my staff, so they felt they could call me all the time. So even when I was with them, I wasn't focused. Yeah. So yeah. what have you told the team? Yeah. What have you told your team? Do you say, right, do not call me? Have, because the way you manage yourself is the way people behave with you, right? Yeah. Look, I just tell everyone, I don't push, I'm a workaholic, I love working. But I don't push anyone to work harder than they want to work. My only advice always is that your objectives in life needs to be in line with, with your compromises, in line with the effort you're willing to put in, right? If you want to achieve this and be the best of the best, and you know you're starting um, later on in life where some people are ahead of you and you want to overtake up. everyone mm -hmm. and catch up, uh, then you just have to compromise on everything else in your life in order for you to get there. Uh, but of course, everyone, depending on, I would say, the age group, people have different priorities, right? So if you, if you can't compromise on a few of the important boxes in your life, that's it. Then align your objectives. Do you have 
different management levels so they don't just does everybody have your mobile phone uh no that, oh, that's otherwise good. i wouldn't be able to exactly yeah. so yeah. there's a levels of access to you yeah. in yeah. your company yeah yeah definitely yeah with uh, i would say during COVID, uh we've worked really hard on restructuring and planning for the coming five years mm -hmm. so we came up with our 2027 plan uh, and i would say we've worked even harder than out of COVID. the good thing is that during COVID, there wasn't much focus on sales it was more on I felt that the opportunity that was given to everyone then is to really take a step back, assess where you are and where you want to go. Reevaluate. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I think we've, we've done really well with our planning, which gave us a great head start the minute COVID uh, it was over. Yeah. yeah. And um, thank you for that. So why would I want to work for your company? Because there's yeah. thousands of agencies out there, right? What, was, what would be the top three or four reasons why I should work for that? Well, I think, I think number one, the future is owned by the most tech savvy companies. And technology for a period of time was, you know, used just as a motor. Everyone was thinking about technology. Some people think technology is about scanning a barcode and showing that this is, uh, instead of having your a classic business card. But technology is, it's something very serious. It's not easy to keep up with. It costs a lot of time, money, and effort. But companies who do what it takes are the companies who are gonna own the future. And I think for the last six to eight years, we've invested heavily on, in our tech. And we've really even compromised on sales and on, on other things just to make sure that we have mm -hmm. a scalable infrastructure. So the tech tools that we've cascaded and we've built for our real estate agents is, uh, is just, just too good to be true if, if someone from outside or someone who's been to the industry, to other companies come and see what we've, what we've built. And then? Uh, and then um, our value system. I think if you ask me, what, I'm, a, I'm a really good salesman. And if you ask me if you're asked, give me one tip about sales. I'd say the best salespeople on earth are those who know how to sell the truth. So you understand the product, the service, and then you sell the truth. Even if it's, even if the apartment has, everything has pros and cons, right? You have to Share be ready to literally mm -hmm. sell both. Address any concerns or downsides and highlight the, upside. Of, of the, the features and the benefits and, and what so have you. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've made sure that when we say our value system, it actually runs throughout everything we do internally and externally in the company. So you have a HR department and how did you, I mean, this, the, this scale, you've gone from zero to 800 people in 13 years, right? Yeah. So 14 years, 14 years, 14 years yeah. 13 and a half yeah. makes sounds yeah. good. Yeah. So, um, how did you scale so fast? and hire the right people. Let's say you have to hire a HR manager who has the same values as you. How do you find them and how long did it take you to train them to share your values so you can trust them and let them go and let them run it for you? That's one of my challenges. Back, That's one of my challenges. The number one is the infrastructure. Okay. Okay. If you want to scale, you have to make sure that you have a system. Okay. Because reset is very simple in, in principle, right? You hire an agent, you split the commission with them, 50-50, 60-40, whatever it is, right? So if it was that simple, then every company would have 10,000 agents. Correct. Why not? Because number one, you need a system. So to scale, you need a system. You need governance and a very solid governance in place. And to make sure that that system works and everyone complies, you need to make sure that the system is automated. The same way when you go to a supermarket and you say, give me a discount, they say, no, we can't, it's on the system. Right now, if I tell you open a supermarket, anyone can start a supermarket. Sure. But if I tell you run 200 supermarkets without a system in place, you cannot do that. So the first thing from you know a CEO or a company owner, or entrepreneur, you need to invest in that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you can onboard people uh, to it. You and don't bring someone and uh, without things. systems. So yeah. you put the systems first, knowing you're going to scale, yeah. and then you hire the right people. Yeah. And how about training them? Because value is a soft skills, right? Yeah. 
You can't systemize values. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe you can, but you still have to have the right people. It's, it's yeah. an emotional thing, isn't it, right? So how do you hire your first 10 staff to make sure they share the same values as you? They tick the uh, same way. You I know what I mean? In Emotionally. The, in the interview, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, when I interview people, I, I'm very intuitive. You still interview people? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Key people. Okay. Uh, in fact, as an entrepreneur, that's my job. I go out every day. I see someone who's got the know-how in certain things. Um, you know, I fund their ideas, and uh, and then I go to business. Okay. Uh, so we're recruiting all day, right? But like I said, in interviews, I'm very intuitive. So when I sit with someone, uh, I don't. You can ask so many questions. I mean, by me asking, who are the top? I don't know. Three speakers you listen to. Mm -hmm. Uh, that would tell me something about you, right? Your personality. Because so, everyone is, if you, if. So your questions aren't like the standard CV questions. You have a way of asking questions to open yeah. up some answers that your intuition yeah. picks up on. Yeah. And I'm very natural. I'm not, I'm not too it's a conversation with my, yes, yeah. with my interviews. Yeah. So who are the top three people you listen to? Uh, I mean, it depends what I'm looking for, but obviously I like Tony Robbins. You kind of listen to someone for so long, and then you, you move, on to, and then you move on to the next. Right. Uh, so I don't have someone who I take blindly everything. everything. Yeah, I believe it's the same way in the in the gym. What works for I don't know for my biceps might not work for your biceps. Correct. So you kind of try and see what you want to achieve, and and then you. So your top three yeah. favorites: Tony Robbins. Tony I'm, Robbins. I'm a Tony Robbins coach. I, I'm okay. Yeah. We ran the world running yeah. uh, teams for him. So yeah, I, I love his. Amazing. Have you have you been to any well. any of his seminars? No, no, or you I should go. No, no. You should uh, go. Uh, Gary V. Yes. Yeah. And there's definitely something that I appreciate about uh, Grant Cardone. Yes. Uh, not everything. Something. Certain. Yeah. You yeah. know the funny thing is about Grant Cardone is that Simon you? also is. Uh, Simon, Simon uh, say it with me. No, I don't know. But Grant, I'm sure, you know. I'm sure I've seen him. I'm yeah, terrible yeah. with names also. Yeah. But the funny thing about Grant Cardone is, do you see that um, conversation he had with the Wolf of Wall Street when they didn't get on and they argued? Yeah, yeah. Who did you support? I can't recall. I can't recall the discussion. The Wolf really. of Wall Street was talking about get on the phone and make yeah. calls. And... Grant was talking about build a social media platform and you can sell $10 to 10,000 people and you become rich. Yeah. What Wolf of Wall Street was saying that you just get on the phone and make the deal happen. So I kind of yeah. saw both. You need that to start off with to fund the social media because social media takes yeah. time. I don't think neither of them were wrong, but it was just a big clash of egos. Yeah. I think you've just nailed it. Mm -hmm. Each one is different. Compliments I mean, to, the other, yeah. to start with, you need to gain some experience so Correct. you can become natural with your content. And then you can go to social media. And to build that experience, you need to have more Mileage. dialogues, yeah, right? Exactly. With, with people. And exactly. the fastest way to get to that engagement is on the phone. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Still, the blower works. Yeah. Even now, 40 years in sales, my best aphrodisiac is get on the phone and close a deal. Do you ever yeah. do that? Yeah. Do you still close deals or no? No, no. Uh, I do, but more at, scale. Yeah, more at the yeah, larger scale mm -hmm. investment, not really in dealers. Mm -hmm. Is there still opportunity in Dubai to make money? Yeah, there are always opportunities in Dubai and anywhere else in the world, I think. So if uh, I came to you with 10 million dirhams, yes. is there a good opportunity for, for me to flip quick money or you would say best to sit and wait? Or Okay, again, I'm risk averse, mm -hmm. so I don't like speculation. Okay. And whenever I want to invest, I say, okay, I have 10 million or a million. I'm going to buy this. I need to factor my exit strategy. Whom am I going to rent out to or whom am I going to sell out to? Mm -hmm. Why would these people buy at that given time? What if more supply comes? What if the worst case scenario? Any investment decision I make, whether it's to do with real estate or opening a business or scaling my business, mm -hmm. I have to tick the box of if the worst case scenario happens, I can still survive and I can still, you know, come Prosper. right. Yes. And then I start qualifying which one is gives me, you know, better returns. Mm -hmm. uh, and Dubai is a very dynamic market. 
And I think everything in terms of the local and the global fundamentals is supporting Dubai in every way, shape and form. Whether you look at the interest rate, for example, hike, we've always said that Dubai is not a mortgage driven market. Right. So if you look at the cash transactions to uh, uh, cash to mortgage transactions, you would see that mainly we're a cash driven market. Uh, unlike what you see in, in Europe. Um, and that's that's something really important in the current environment we're, we're living in. I think also Dubai, the city is being built as we speak. So it's not like in Syria even. If you buy something, you leave it for 10, 20, 30 years, it will always keep appreciating uh, somehow. Mm -hmm. But Dubai is different. Dubai works differently. You have to identify the trends in Dubai. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand when to enter and, and when to exit. There's a great deal of opportunities in, in, in these. Uh, so if, if I can be 10 million and said, look, I'm, I'm okay with risk, but I'm looking at flipping. Is there, is there a desperate seller or anything like that? There are opportunities out there? Because uh, I'm not a buy and hold guy. Okay. Right? Yeah, I think today with, with, uh, with the transparent data we have, it's very easy you for find. you to qualify what's a good deal and what not. So mm -hmm. you simply go and you type the project name, you see the transactions, how did it trend in the last five years or three years, whatever. And you can really identify what happened last week. And you know, anything below 10 to 20% is a great, is a great uh, opportunity to, yeah. to jump on. So your salespeople aren't salespeople, they're more consultants now, right? They should I be. always they should be. I always, 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 you know, try and embed this in the minds of mm -hmm. my agents. Mm -hmm is that you have to sell the truth, which means you have to go and you have to understand the data, the facts, what makes you believe that this is the best, the best opportunity? What makes you believe that this is gonna appreciate? What makes you believe that this is gonna give you the 5% returns? And that's how you build your sales pitch. Also, I think that they should have a genuine childlike interest in the person sitting opposite them. I've sat in sale and they ask three questions, then they start pitching. I said, you've got to ask minimum 15 questions. You've got to understand, show you care, and the person trusts you. And then they listen to you. Then, of course, you've got to tell the truth as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's ABC. You need to understand the needs of your clients. I think the questions you ask people would either get people to say, you know what, he knows what he's talking about. He asked the right questions. Or be like, this guy does not even have to Just qualify. wants to sell me something. Yeah. It's not interested. Yeah. 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 And there's that disconnect happens. Yeah. And no matter how good the project is, they can't sell it. Many salespeople don't ask the right questions. Yeah. They and miss clients it. lose and, interest. And, yeah, and the questions are sequential. Like, they're not related to each other. Yeah, yeah. Do you do training? And if somebody starts, and how? We're very big on training. Okay, tell me. Uh, so today so we have Let's say I came to your academy. company. Yeah. I'm dead enthusiastic. I want to get into real estate. I heard about your company. I've seen you, I love your values, I love your standards, I want to work for you. What in return will I get back from the company? So we have, so to start with, before you join the sales floor, you have to go through a two weeks academy. Okay. And in that academy, we give you everything you really need to know. Uh, and, and this, the information that we share with you during the academy will feed you for the coming two years, I would say, not for the coming two months. Okay. Uh, and I think, I mean, if you think about it, the difference between an agent who sells a, a penthouse for a hundred million and a studio for half a million is literally experience. Because yes. even with your network and, and, and you need experience, yes. right? And experience is made out of knowledge and practice. And time. Right? Yeah. yeah. Through time. So, yeah, through time. Yeah. yeah. So, and that's where hard work comes to play. You can either you know engage with five clients a week, or you work harder and engage with fifty clients a week, right. and that's that's in your hand to to fast track your Numbers. success. Yeah, uh, and so I am a um, you know I come to train when I come to train people, I be like, I just share with you everything that has worked for me. Maybe there are so many other methods that also works, but I'm sharing with you something that is tested mm -hmm. and. It worked for me and, and it worked for so many people that I trained. And there's no reason for it not to work for you. Yes. So I would say the biggest thing is that we give people the knowledge they need and the platform to exercise that knowledge. And the technology 
that will allow them to leverage their time. Yes. Right. So instead of doing something in in one hour, you can do it on our yes. CRM in literally in a matter of one minute. Yeah. Uh, and so the productivity is massive. Yeah. Yeah. So that's great. So you invest two weeks training them. Yeah. And then. And then the training is ongoing, of course. That's uh-huh. only the academy. Uh-huh. That's only for us. These are your say, in-house team. Yeah. Yeah. And how many do you have going through your system on a monthly or weekly basis? Do you have them every two uh, weeks? It depends if the academy is for juniors, fresh people, completely mm-hmm. without any reason. So you knowledge. segregate them, you divide yeah. by. Yeah. So we have from S1 to S6. Wow. Yeah. So S1 is basically freshers, S6 are the most experienced. So do you find it's easier to train the freshers or the most experienced? For sure, freshers. Yeah, because freshers, they're coming back with experience. Freshers, they are... They, but I would say experienced who are wise and who understand that there's always room for them to, to learn and who understand Very that rare. Yeah, if, you've, I mean, if you've done 10 years in sales, yeah. you're not going to come and hear something for the first time. But when you attend the training and you know, you're know you patient enough and you Open start with the mindset enough. of, you yes. know what, I'm starting on a blank slate. Mm-hmm. By the end of the training, you will have a new perspective. Uh, and that's what most people miss on. I think that's very hard to find because yeah. the ego blinds you. Right. Yeah, yeah. I know everything. I'm this. I'm that. But then, yeah. halfway through training, do you think oh, I should have hired this person? Shake hands goodbye, or do you persevere and stick with them? Because I'm a kind no, of person who says, training, if I one see, or two drop out always. Really? Yeah. We we basically tell them we don't feel that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's either because of not always because of their business capabilities. Sometimes behavior. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes anything to coming do with late the system, or, right, yeah. or their commitment. Exactly. And I think it's really important. And the thing is, end of the day, if you do that, you're saving them. Yeah, yeah. Because then I you'll think. be in a really horrible relationship. They're not happy. You're not happy. It just prolongs. I, oh, I good. Because I find training is a good way to actually filter people. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Um. So, who was your teacher? Because from retail clothing to this, who's taught you systems, structures? Do you have a father who was an entrepreneur, or no? Uh, my father taught me values. Is he still with us? Yeah. Syria or here? Um, back and forth. Okay. Yeah. And I think if you have that alongside your drive, you can make miracles. Because if you think about it, every single human on earth, they look for whether you're buying a cup of tea or you're buying a car or a building, you want to deal with someone who has the right value system and know how. And if you create a personal brand, that portrait both that you have the right value system and know how everyone will wish to be with you and uh, and i think that's the key to everything i did wow beautiful uh, and what does he get I, that? is I, it, I is it religious it. values is it religious or mixed or was he i come from a conservative family to a certain extent uh, but i think you know i don't know i'm, I'm a muslim so I at the end of the day, our values is our daily life, you know, the, the, the things that you, and I think many other religions are, are the same. It's about being good uh, on a daily basis. It's yes. about being honest with people. I think no religion will tell you, that, will teach you how to lie to people. Sure. Right? Right. So certain, to a balance, religion yeah. is important. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so what does your dad think of you now? He's seen you grow He's from, happy. yeah. Yeah. Tell for me. me, my family, for me, my family is everything. My parents and my brother and... So you, there's only two brothers, one brothers. sister, one brother. Yeah. yeah. Three of you. Your sister works also with you? Or? No. My sister is in Syria with uh, her husband's kids, but also she comes back and forth. Okay. So the, what, what drove you? Because there's something, I'll tell you what drove me was proving my mom wrong. Because you never thought I could make it, right? So something inside me wants to prove her wrong. And that was my driving force. What's been your driving force? Honestly, I get asked this question a lot. And every time I think about it, I come up with a different answer. Uh, what drives me? I just think the belief that I have inside me that I can always do better. And I just sometimes, I, it shocks me to see people knowing that if they do more, they will get more and they will progress in whichever direction. Uh, you know, uh, aspect of their life, mm-hmm. and they just don't. Does that piss you off? Yeah, somehow. That's the, uh, yeah. one of the but reasons. But then I get used to it. 
you look at Anthony Robbins, right? Tony Robbins. Yeah. He trains one session, 12,000 people. When he says dollars, 20 people get up and walk out. So why are you walking out? He didn't say pounds. I'm like, what about the message? You know, the, yeah. because somebody of your caliber, your social media status, your success, you're going to get lots of haters, right? Yeah, yeah. How do you deal with that? I just don't. I just don't deal with it at all. I just, honestly, I just don't pay attention to it at all. Did you at the beginning? Uh, no, no. You come across yeah. somebody very focused, and um, I didn't realize you were so, by the way, I might respect you, I didn't realize you were highly value-driven, okay? Because some of the social media I saw was the flash cars and the lifestyle, and I was like, maybe he's a bit, um, uh, yeah, maybe money's got to him a little bit, yeah. okay? Yeah. So how do you get your values across to people? Because that's just coming in, to me so okay. strong right now. I think it's I think it's in the way you behave and it's in actions more than in talks. Uh, like for example, the fact that we're the only company in Dubai that invested for the last five years before any other company, including portals, mm -hmm. in educating people and in sharing with people the real value of the transactions in Dubai. We're the first company who actually, with the cooperation of collaboration with Dubai Land Department, that brought the leasing transactions value to market. And, and you, you didn't know, have to. had you didn't a lot of to, resistance, right? yes. even internally. Like, for example, some one of the salespeople would say, but if I'm selling this for $3 million and the client went to the XP Interact and saw something that was sold in the same building for 2.8, it's not going to buy from me. I say, learn how to deal with it. There's a reason why something was sold for 2.8. And now we're trying to sell this for three. Long as, uh, I mean, Bitcoin was yesterday maybe three, today it's six, tomorrow it's eight, and then it's back to 1,000. Mm -hmm. There's always a reason for why it's, it's up and down. Mm -hmm. And if you understand your market well, you should be able to address these things and to still sell. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, and I think that's, the, and that's how we sell. The first thing, you know, clients ask me, okay, what's in it for you in the XP Interact? And I say, our sales pitch works as follow. The first thing we talk about is we try to, of course, after you understand, I'm away from all the classic stuff, understanding your, the needs of your clients and, and, yes. and. But when I meet people for the first time, the f especially if they're new to Dubai, I say, okay, Dubai is a very secure, transparent market. The government want you to make, wants you to make you a well-informed decision. And hence they shared with you all the transactions, which means whether you're a seller or a buyer, I could tell you this is worth a million. But you can also go to the XP Interact, type the project name, and you will understand exactly how much this property sold for last week, last month, last year, last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then you make your decision. And when they trust your process, and when they see that you're very transparent about it, because believe it or not, with the XP Interact, there were some companies who were providing data only to agents. And that was the trigger for me to start it with, with to be honest, all the credit goes to my brother because he's the... Tech. guru of mm -hmm. you know of tech uh, but when they used to come to our company and they used to tell agents okay if you are dealing with a buyer you need to go and to create a report that shows only the most expensive transactions that happen this project so you can upsell and if you're dealing with a seller select only the lowest, the lowest. transactions so you can drop the price down sure. and that really pissed me off and then uh, me and my brother we decided that we're going to take this on and that's like about five years back and uh, yeah, and just living up to, you know, your your value system is not just by saying, hey, we're, and it's not something you can communicate even if you say it. Yeah. It's not, hey, uh, trust me, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. very good. I'm, no, today, if someone tells me, show me in your company, internally or externally, how do you actually live up to the value system you created? The transparency, there you are. We'll the respect. Take care of you, trans, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I mean, I sign on the checkbook of some of my clients, literally. Mm -hmm. Wow. I signed on their checkbook. And uh, yeah, and that didn't happen overnight. That happened over, you know, the, the past 10 years. Yes. They see that you're, you're straightforward and you have the know-how. What about competition? Yeah. Because it's a highly competitive market. Are they trying to copy what you do? I think it's very normal. I think mm -hmm. 10 years back, five years back, eight years back used to, you know, get to me. Uh, but then, but then now it's like you know the minute we launch something new, we know that if it's not the next day, it's Somebody five days later. To copy it. Yeah. But then you're just going to be ahead all yeah. the time. You're going to yeah, keep investing, exactly. keep growing.
Yeah. What does the future hold for you? Because you talk about scaling. So are you in Abu Dhabi? Uh, oh, well, we did Abu Dhabi a long time back. Okay. Uh, but we did it only project based. Okay. Uh, so we did two projects in Abu Dhabi, Marian Sunset Day Villas and the Fairmont. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Two billion dirhams value. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, but we're not there at the same brokerage level we're in Dubai. Okay, so you just you're scaling. You're gonna stay in Dubai. You're not gonna go to Saudi or Dubai. anything. Like yeah, we have we have. I mean, we've been to China before COVID. Uh, we did some work in London as well, Turkey. Um, but now we have some really exciting plans that you're you know not we'll, share right we'll now. come will come when when it happens. Okay, cool. Yeah. You said you invested in companies. Yeah. Tell me about your idea. How do people know that you invest? What are the kind of things you're looking for? What kind of returns you're looking for? Are you investing in people? What's a, because I invest every month in one company. Yeah. Uh, and none of them have been local. They've been like Scandinavia, London, Germany, America. Weird. Okay. But not one project I've seen here that's excited me. Okay. So what are you looking for? It's uh, Dubai, pretty much. Okay. But I invest in people. Okay. If I'm convinced with someone, that's the time I, you know, I invest. I mean, one day I was just walking in the corridors of the office and I saw one of the agents on his laptop creating a presentation. And I just walked up to him and I said, okay, what is this? He explained to me. Um, I mean, very soon over the coming few weeks, he will become an actual partner in one of my businesses. Would you like to share what the business uh, that was? What was it about his presentation? Yeah, it's the, it's, do you think you stupid person? You should be selling property and the, not doing silly yeah, presentations. It's the, it's, it was a reset presentation, but he's going to be a partner in my reset development management okay. company. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a management company as well, like holiday homes and stuff so, like this? So? so at core, at heart, we're brokers. Mm -hmm. We do off-plan and resale and leasing, but we have property management. We have engineered snagging and inspection. We have interior design, we have uh, reset development management, reset development advisory, we have uh, mortgage brokerage. Um, I think everything, everything, name it, you name it. We have but it's it. all in the development and property. There's Every nothing outside. Business. You don't invest in anything outside. No, it has really? to have synergy with I see, my, I see. With my Mine's business. got nothing to do with my business. Okay. No, I just randomly, I just like a project, see an opportunity like AI or. You know, okay. Web3 and stuff like this, I invest. Mm. But for me, the first rule, and that's what I wrote, and that's what my book is all about. The first rule of investing for me is I really need to understand what I'm investing in. If someone tells me, is it better to do stock market or real estate? I say, you have more knowledge on the stock market. Invest there, but then do stock you, market and then do real estate as tier mm -hmm. two investment for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. uh, but if but if you don't know both, I'm sure understanding the real estate market is far, you know, is, is, is far easier than understanding the stock market. Yes. yes. Uh, so I need to understand what I'm investing in. Mm -hmm. No matter how brilliant the opportunity look mm -hmm. at the outside mm -hmm. and how many people are following it and how trendy it is, if I don't really understand it, I just don't invest in it. And of course, the struggle here, that's why you have venture capital companies. The, you know, doing the diligence on opportunities is a full time, mm -hmm. it's a full time job. Would you be interested in joining a venture capitalist company? I don't have, uh, a, I don't have one. I'm just asking. Uh, <laughs> There's no side. Yeah, I of mean, it. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm an opportunist as well. So if I see an opportunity, I, I jump on it. I have just certain boxes to tick. One of these boxes, I want to understand what I'm investing in. That's sure. really important. Sure. Oh, amazing. I mean, it took me three years going back and forth to London before I put my first down there. And what do you do in London? You open up an agency there for a short no, period of time? You invested in a property? No, so basically we buy refurbished and sell. In, the, in London? Yeah. Whereabouts in London? City centre? Uh, south. South of London. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. London's a strange market, isn't it? It's been mature, but now they're I mean, struggling. The minute you're out of the centre, yeah. you're Knights a completely Bridge different the city, mm. right? Uh, in terms of Dynamics, price tag, price per square foot, your audience uh, or your clientele. Yeah. I see properties like Jumeirah Beach Hotel, the new two properties on the, the right hand side, if you like the wave. They're going for silly prices, more than London or New York. Yeah. yeah. The apartments, the, the penthouses. penthouses. Yeah. Yeah. 50 million, I think, right yeah. now we're looking so at. I one. think when you look at the 
when you look at the price per square foot mm -hmm. and at the size of these properties, they're still better um, than Yeah. I mean, these are trophy assets. Mm. The owners don't probably you know, ever live there, they, they move they, around. They had to build Burj Al Arab for the last, I don't know how many years, Anjumeira Beach Hotel, and they have to develop that area for the last 20 years for them to create a penthouse of 40,000 square feet, mm -hmm. three floors, mm -hmm. for it to sell at 400 million. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you, do you sign um, exclusive with developers or do you open to? Yeah, we have a big exclusive. Mm -hmm. Port, I mean, profile of exclusive projects with us. So do you find like developers are queuing up to sign with you or do you go hunting for developers to sign with I you? I would well? only take an exclusive project if I am sure that I can sell it. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to go and to promise someone that, hey, you can sell that overnight or you can sell that within a period of time. Probably eight out of 10 would give us their, uh, their projects. But I have to make sure that I have the interest, deliver. the resources, uh, and the time to, you know, to, to, to deliver. I mean, we have the largest sales force in town. Absolutely. So you can imagine. Tell me about your annual meetings. I, I, I've seen it a few times. It looks yeah. amazing. Thank you, you very much. Tell me. I think it just, uh, um, it's an opportunity to obviously celebrate the success that with the people that make this success happen. Have you had that from day one or is it something you created recently? Since 2013. Wow, amazing. Yeah. But like before it was it more of like a one day magic. training uh -huh. and it was like full on. I remember the first one I did was on a Friday. Back then Friday was, was an off day. It was Friday from 8 a.m. until 6 p.m. And it's it's almost a training session. Yes. It's almost just, you know, saying, okay, guys, this is what we're doing. Recalibrate. This is what we want yeah. to do. Mm -hmm. And this is how we're going to do it. And these are the, you know, the, the focal points that I need you to learn more about. And it's, it's more of just aligning people towards the same mission and, and, and vision uh, and the company and objectives uh, and then it's cascaded to every department and then you've seen it grow yeah yeah from 2000 tell me how many people do you have in the first one how many is i'm sure you said well, i i said this sometimes and i got five thousand people watching or like nobody wanted to talk to me 10 years ago now i've got five thousand people yeah and listening to me you pinch yourself yeah. do, you, do you do that yeah. or you got used to it now just like uh, no big deal. i think it's always i mean it's always i focus more on the process I noticed so that. As I feel well, like yeah. everything, everything else will follow. Uh, wow, you're very I mean, systems driven about, and operations. Yeah. And amazing. Even when I talk about money, like you, you never see someone successful in business but broke. So when I say focus on the process, focus on long term. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying don't care about money, but money will follow. If you know how to do a deal well, money will follow. If you know how to deal with clients, money will follow. Does uh, money inspire you? Um, I think I've walked away from so many deals that I could make so much more money uh, because it's just, it wasn't me. So when uh, you wake up in the morning, well, at the beginning, I'm sure money motivated you pay the rent, a nice house, give the kids some schooling, education, wife happy, right? It's money. money what does is, money mean money to is, you? Money what does is, money mean look, to you? Money has been always important to me. Yes. And it will be always important to me. Mm -hmm. But it's the process of getting money since I had no money up until now, hasn't changed. It was always focus. The focus was not money and is not money and will never be money. And that's what I tried my best to teach my kids because money goes and come. The focus is always about the delivery. It's when you do the process well and you can create value, that's the time money will follow. So you teach your kids. Tell me, I, I teach my kids that money every day. So money comes easy to me. It flows. Right, yeah, I teach them that yeah. it's the. They should. A lot of people have issues with money, right? Yeah, yeah. Because of the upbringing and stuff like that. So, were your parents wealthy? Um, I would say, comfortable. Mid. Okay, so yeah. you didn't have a fear of money. Um, not, not so. I mean, not to the extent of, you know, eat, eat and drink. Sure. But of course, we always. I always aspire to. I mean, among the, in the neighborhood I was living in, I would say I was. Everyone else around me probably had more than me. No. Okay. So you just want to do better. You always want yeah. to. Okay. And then do you have goals that you want to buy a car, a house and stuff like this? And do you still have them? Honestly, I never had these goals. Mm -hmm. I never had. My goal is always process oriented. Easy. My goal is, okay, I want to get, for example, to, I want to start my own business. I want to start one more business. I want to get to 50. From day agents. one, you were like that. Yeah. From, wow. Yeah. And what made you come to Dubai? 
Uh, you just took the risk. You were the only one out of the I family. I just wanted to 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 get out of, of Syria. Yeah. yeah. And uh, now you travel. I, I, you have a Jewish citizenship. Syria. I had yeah. no problem with, with you know with being in Syria. Of course, but I wanted a place with more opportunities. That's all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you have a dual citizenship now. You can travel everywhere. You still have a I can Syria. travel everywhere. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Because yeah. I I have a British citizenship, and I sometimes take it for granted. And I see my colleagues are Syrian and stuff, yeah, and they can't yeah, travel yeah, anywhere. Yeah. My so wife and kids are English, so are they? Oh, English wonderful. Well. Thank you. Are they light skin, dark skin? Your children? Do they? Uh, in between. Because I wouldn't think you were Syrian. Thanks. I think maybe Italian. Yeah. In any way in Europe, you'll get away with your Greek, yeah. Spanish, <laughs> Italian. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I get that. No, so yeah. I'm Iranian born. Yeah. Oh, okay. Not many love. Oh, I think only North Korea likes us <laughs> that's the only place i'm welcome <laughs> with that passport you guys are as well yeah. yeah so you have iranians coming to you now are there lots still iranians coming yeah especially in the last two months really yeah why do you Third think on the market i think just you know uh, economy always follows politics and mm. uh, yeah i'm not really into politics no but, but you know to, to the extent of you know understanding and analyzing the dynamics yes Uh, that impacts did, did the you business. find the same thing with the Russian war? A lot of people came as he's eased down a bit, or is it still the same with the war with Ukraine and stuff? Because a lot of people say it's not really just about Russians. Mm-hmm. I think the entire world is, is unsettled, mm-hmm. right? And uh, what you know, the area that used to be like the only geopolitical uh, uh, that had like a geopolitical risk today has much lesser geopolitical risk than you know what you see in Europe and uh, and of course also the the concerns around the economy and the dollar and the conspiracy and I don't know what that's also telling people diversity and to diversify I think this place is is Incredible. far more mature than any mm-hmm. other spot in the region. You got a safety aspect of people living here. Yeah. What makes you lose sleep at night? Anything? You sleep lose, soundly? Uh, yeah I think I sleep really well. How many hours uh, of sleep do you need? Five to six. Wonderful. Yeah. And then no worries, no nothing. No concerns, nothing. You go to bed with a my, list of I'm things. I'm very so. emotional. Really? Yeah. My kids although, for sure keep me up. Although your system's base, you're still very emotional. Yeah. So When you say emotional, do you cry easily? Do you me. cry easily? Yeah. When do you cry? Watching movies and yeah. stuff? Really? Yeah. From the cinema, my wife will always put her hand like this. Really? I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't. Oh, my, uh, my My kids. My kids, it's a challenge. Bringing up kids is a, you know, you yeah. asked me at the beginning, what are the challenges? And I think that's, that's your is a challenge yeah. probably every dad. I spent the weekend uh, with my eight-year-old this weekend. Yeah. And um, the questions he was coming out with was incredible. And we had a holiday this week coming to, uh, to Italy, Naples. Yeah. And I reduced it from five to three. Because my wife said, no, five days is too long. I said, look, we're in Naples, let's enjoy it. Yeah. And then I spent the weekend with him. I thought, I can't spare an extra two days away. Yeah. And I reduced yeah. it to three days. It's a wedding we're going to. Yeah. Okay. And I just thought, it's such precious time. I didn't have a father. So I always wanted to be the father that I'd never had. And uh, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Just the environment, the social media. The... I never want to be like a successful father with kids that who are not as successful. Mm-hmm. So I always tell my kids, you know, money goes and come. And, You know, never take it for granted. What brings money is one, two, three, four. That's so if I asked them, that. what's your dad like? What would they say? But they wouldn't say just he's emotional, would they? They say, they no. say he's fun, he's this, he's serious, he's yeah. systems based. What would they yeah. say? Well, I think they would say he's. Uh, well, I can't say. I can't speak for them. I if they did, better if you. What would they say? You ask them. What would they say? Would you? We'll bring them to book. What would you like them to say? Uh, I know what my my my, my kids, <laughs> my kids will say something like he's very loving. I'm always hugging and kissing them. Always. Yeah. They say I'm sensitive. Um, because I've I've had two heart attacks, and I think oh, a lot of it's it's the best thing that's ever happened. Um, I think a lot of people. I don't want my children to take anything for granted. Yeah. So I keep reminding them how blessed that's lives the they have. Most important yeah. thing, to be honest. Humble. And it's not easy to when they have everything. Yeah. Right. Especially in Dubai. I mean, life could not be easier for them, right? Yes. My so son went, um, them. my 15-year-old went uh, paintball shooting. I'm, I'm getting all the notifications on my phone. 
Uber there, this, yeah. this, this, Uber back, yeah. cinema, Vox, yeah. Premier, Light Down. Easy. Yeah. It's almost unreal. It is unreal. Right. Or is it real? Yeah. Which is real, right? Yeah. Because yeah. you can't go. I was in London a couple of months ago. I couldn't even have my phone in my yeah. hand. Yeah. Didn't have to have a nice watch. Yeah, you can't. You can't. So what is real? Yeah. Yeah, that's also true. Yeah. I think it's just I'm, I focus on making sure that they have what it takes to weather out difficult times. When you, when you tell them, do they go like, oh God, that's off again. Oh God, he's, he's preaching again. Uh, Sometimes you see that. Not, the, I would say <laughs> not that yet. They, are, they are receptive. Oh. Not yet. Maybe, maybe when he's 13, 14. Oh, believe me, he's maybe coming. Maybe they will start, but, but no, no they're Brace very yourself. receptive, especially when, and you have to choose the time, right? Mm. Yes. I mean, you're not going to tell them, stop playing, come listen to me. Mm -hmm. uh, Do they play on the computers? Uh, yeah, but we try to limit it. Thank you. Uh, have, they have they started negotiating they have... yet? Get off. No, another half an hour. Another oh, Just when I finish this game. Do they yeah, do that I to you? That's classic. All kids, right? The thing is, I don't want to shut them down. Yeah. Because I want yeah. them to argue. Because if you start saying, no, listen to me, then you're killing all their yeah. salesmanship. Does that make sense? Yeah. We have a rule in the house that we always give them 10 minutes notice. Uh -huh. So we say in 10 minutes, you And then you go, this. eventually, tell me you're going to switch it off. Yeah. You switch yeah. it off. Yeah. They don't switch yeah. it off, right, most of the time. Um, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. go over, pick up the remote control. That was your 10 minutes. Yeah, I think long as you give them a heads up, mm -hmm. then you should have the right to switch off, right? Perfect. And where do yeah. you go on holiday? So once a year, you go at different uh, places? Nature. Yeah, and anywhere where there's good nature, mainly Europe, of course. Mm -hmm. Whereabouts? Uh, you have a favorite place? Norway. Norway is amazing. It is supposed to be an amazing country. We go remote places mm -hmm. uh, where almost you don't even have your reception on your phone. Can you disconnect for a month? No, for a month, no. Mm -hmm. So you always have access <laughs> somewhere yeah, along yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah. Maybe no Wi-Fi, but there's a cable yeah. access somewhere. Yeah, no. I mean, no one can disconnect completely one month from mm -hmm. your, if you're so business, business. business and I'm still, still a bit operational. I was after, gonna right? say, where, how do you spend your day every day? What do you do every day? Uh, when do you go to the right? gym? First thing in the morning, late at night, middle of the day? Whenever I have the time. Mm -hmm. I have to just make sure that five days a week, I gotta do it. Do you have a personal trainer or you just train yeah. yourself? You do? Yeah. But even if he's not there, I train myself. Wow, where, where'd you yeah. go? Since COVID, then now I train at home. Wow. Uh, yeah. Since COVID, I haven't been to a gym. Is that a choice? Other, other because you don't, don't want to catch anything, or is it just because? No, it's just no time. Mm -hmm. You know, you manage with the resources you have. Mm -hmm. Just there's no time to Do you find the gym. If there's no personal training, you still push it. yourself, right? You still push. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. I just tell myself something's better than nothing. You just you keep go, moving. You push yourself. And you're only you 38. And, uh, Young yeah. enough to be my son. Oh my yeah. God, I feel old. God, Congratulations, man. It's, 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 it's how proud of you, man. I'm so proud of you. And it's been such a so pleasure much. meeting you. I'm very humble. I, Thank you. Saying. Let's do this again if, we, yeah. if you're yeah. up for it, maybe a month or so. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually yeah. going, when are you going away in summer? July. July. I'm going away July yeah. and August. Let's do another one yeah. September. Yeah. 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 And then we'll Definitely. take it to the next level. All right. Let's do it. Thank you so much for organizing this. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. big time. Yeah. yeah, I honor you, my gladiator. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's change thank details. Yeah, please. Yeah, I love yeah, that. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, I'll give you my. Please now. and and by the way, we will put all your contact details, uh, fan properties, yeah. everything on the bottom of the okay. video when we promote it. And uh, gladiators, I hope you had the most amazing time like I did, and I salute you all. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you so yeah. much.